This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 184. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host to the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, Brandon Turner. What's going on, man? Guess who just had a birthday? Uh, this guy know. right here. Uh, did this you? Guy, yeah. Did I get to see you at 4 a.m. on you your birthday? You did. We saw each other for about eight seconds on my birthday. Yeah, man. Because yeah, we were, man. you know, yeah, I was sleeping and you rolled over and got out of bed. And <laughs> Don't be creepy and talk about me in bed. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what happened. No, me and Josh were in Chicago and yes. uh, did a little uh, podcast conference and we learned a lot about podcasting and talked to other podcasters. The podcast movement. It was, the podcast it was movement. Good. Yeah. And uh, anyway, we did not we share did a, a bed. We didn't we share did. a bed, but we did do a session. We did do a session. Yeah. The session yeah. Was, was titled, uh, here's why your podcast is boring. Yeah. Boring. Yeah. It was a, it was a good, good session. We had like eight, fun. eight people in there. They laughed. Some people. It was more than eight people in there. <laughs> it was good. It was good. It we was talked good. about podcasting. So, uh, yeah, yeah anyway, so yeah, but Josh had to catch an airplane at like two in the morning because you're weird and book early <laughs> flights and uh, I slept in because it was my birthday. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, 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 happy, happy belated birthday, Brandon. Thank you. Darling. And happy anniversary. Belated oh, thank you. As well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, all right, man. Well, we, we've got a really cool show today. I'm, I'm, I've yeah. got, you know, this new energy coming off of that podcast conference. I, I, it was fun meeting. We got to meet some of our, our listeners. We got to meet tons of other podcasters and that was, that was amazing. But, uh, today's show is, is really cool. And, and, um, l- let's just say that this guy has got a little bit of experience. Yeah, man. He's just, a, just, a just a little, just a little, yeah. but before we get to his story, Oh, I'm going to cut you off right there and okay, go straight it. into today's quick, oh, quick tip. tip. <laughs> you almost forgot that one. Sound, no, I know, I know what I'm doing here. All right, good. Today, today's quick tip is uh, for those of you guys who are members of Bigger Pockets, you know that we offer keyword alerts on the community, on the forum. So if somebody's talking about a mortgage and you set up a keyword alert for mortgage, you're going to get notified and then you could gump, jump in and you know, either read or, or get involved in the conversation. Uh, we used to have limitations we, on, on our uh, free tier and on our uh, plus tier, but we have now opened up uh, our keyword alerts. So all users, all people with a account on bigger pockets can now have unlimited keyword alerts. So you can set up as many keywords as you want. So do use those for things like, you know, your local, your local area. If you're in Denver, set up a keyword alert for Denver. Set up, you know, other local towns around Denver. Set up, uh, you know, you can do combination keyword alerts. You can do all sorts of fancy stuff. Check it out at biggerpockets.com slash alerts. Get your keyword alerts set up today. And especially if you're trying to grow a brand, build a business, things like that, it's a great opportunity to jump in and answer questions related to your niche um, and, uh, you know, let you grow as an expert in our little world. There so that's uh, today's not so quick, quick tip. All right. Not so quick, quick tip. All right. Moving on. Let's get to the show. You guys are going to love this show, especially because he's a little bit, uh, you know, um, let me, let me tease you with this. Contra- he, he's a little bit uh, controversial in his, uh, we asked him a question later on in the show and we said, should real estate agents get, or investors get their license? We talked about that and uh, he has a very, very interesting take on that that I don't think we've ever heard before. Well, he says the no. Show. Yeah, he says no. And so if you want to know why. Listen up. You do want to know why. That comes later in the show. Listen up. Yes, yes, yes. All right, guys. Uh, today's guest is Bill Lublin. Bill's been in the game for years and years and years. Uh, he works and does uh, lots of uh, traveling and, and events and speaking on behalf of uh, NAR, I believe. I hope I'm not misquoting it, but mm-hmm. uh, he's out there. Uh, he's, he's a very well-known speaker in the real estate space. Uh, he, uh, he's an active investor. He's done, I believe, over 800 deals and he's got his own management company. He's got his own real estate brokerage company and obviously investment firm. So the guy kn- knows what he's talking about. He's been doing this forever. And he's a really, he's a great guy. So yeah. let's bring him on. Bill, welcome to the show, man. Good to have you here. Thank you. It's so nice to see both of you guys uh, with my left and right eye. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. It's uh, good to have you. Josh has been raving about how uh, how cool you are for quite some time. So you know, I know nothing about you at all. Deliberately, be prepared. I know to be nothing. But you do know that Josh has really low standards. Yeah, he does have very <laughs> low standards. <laughs> All right. So today we're talking about real estate, obviously. And uh, I hear you're, you're an agent. Is that correct? No. I'm the CEO of uh, the largest Century 21 company in Pennsylvania, oh. which sort of is like an agent except more. Oh, you run a, so you run a real estate agent business. Yes, I run a real estate company and I employ agents who work with me and I own a property management company. Ah. I own a title company and I own a portfolio of real estate. Okay, so you've been around the block and you, you kind of get this real estate thing. I'm I've been around the block so many times I'm dizzy. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about that today. And you, you, like you said, you are also an investor, so we're going to go through your story a little bit. But why don't we just begin way at the beginning? I mean, what made you initially get into the idea of real estate? Has that been your whole life? Um, no, actually, I had no intention of being in real estate ever. I got into real estate by accident. Uh, my dad was a real estate agent um, who, when I got out of college and was – I guess essentially unemployable, got me a job at the place where he worked. Um, and I was for, and I, I've said this on a number of other podcasts, so I'm, I, I feel like I'm almost proud of it. I was <laughs> possibly the worst real estate agent that ever existed because I was uh, just 21 years old and I was far more interested in um, women with uh, poor eyesight and bad judgment <laughs> and staying up late at night than I was in the real estate business. Nice. Nice. So you start working for your dad. You're a ter terrible agent, he, but he can't fire you because that would be a bad oh, no, thing. No, no, no. Actually, I didn't work for him. I worked for – he worked for someone. Oh, okay. I, okay. I am not an SOB. I am not a son of a broker. Nice. My, my dad was a real estate agent who worked at another company and who convinced the guy that he worked for that he should employ me because my dad was a really good salesman. Got it. And he didn't realize that we would average out into an average salesman because my dad was really good. <laughs> I was really horrible. Nice. So, All right. So we take you guys. You're in the business. How did, how did the path kind of continue? Where, what, what happened next? Um, at the end of my first year, the guy that I worked for, even though he respected my dad and my dad was his top guy, came to me and pretty much told me that I sucked and that <laughs> he was going to have to cut what was – what was called a draw in those days. It was an advance against commission. And uh, um, I was sort of devastated because I was getting very little money and now I was going to get even less. And um, somebody came and recruited me because real estate brokers often recruit anybody with a pulse. Yeah. And I decided I would use that as my new, my new start. So, so I went to work for the guy and I walked in the first day and he said, uh, you come in at nine in the morning, you work until nine at night, you do whatever ever this guy over here tells you and um, we'll see how it works out. And I came in at nine in the morning and I worked until nine at night or later. And um, I learned, I began to learn how to work with buyers and then I learned how to um, ask for the order and I learned about inventory. And at the end of the year, I was his top guy. Cause That's I mean, awesome. this is really a business work ethic more, more than anything else. I think. Yeah. All right. So, so I, Oh, sorry. Sorry. So sorry. Sorry. I don't want to interrupt you here. All right. So oh, you go right ahead. <laughs> all right. So you started working these long, like 12 hour days for this guy, right. learning how work ethic matters. Can you actually talk to that? Uh, talk about that just for a second. There's a lot of people listening to the show who are, I don't know. I don't want to say lack work ethic, but they lack work ethic, right? There's just a lot of our generation, right. my generation, especially that lacks yeah. that. Uh, like how important is that in investing and in being an agent? I mean, like, uh, can you talk about that for a minute? So Woody Allen said that, what is it, 85% of life is just showing up. So work ethic is about showing up. Now, I, I will tell you, having employed hundreds of agents, I would, frankly, rather have a hardworking guy than a very talented guy. Yeah. And, and when I say guy, I mean man or woman, of course. But sure. I, I, somebody who's going to work hard, who's going to show up, who's going to do what you tell them, they're going to be successful. But real estate agents for the most part, have a really poor idea about how the real estate business works. You know, they think, for example, that having a higher commission rate means that you are more successful when the truth is that success in our business is really volume. The yeah. more business you do, the greater the success you have. And then a higher commission split, of course, can follow with that. But we get agents that are 
new in the business. They've done a couple of transactions. They get recruited by a business model that um, is based on the number of bodies in the office. And there are several of them. We don't have to name them because they're very proud of themselves and they name themselves. Um, <laughs> but so what happens is they, they because they've been recruited now, they come in and they want to get the kind of commission split that a really productive agent who's doing five, six, nine, 10, 12 million dollars worth of business is getting and they haven't earned it yet. So, it, so that's sort of the problem. People don't get that. You know, we talk to agents in, in recruiting all the time and we pride ourselves on being a leads rich environment, being a, a company of opportunities. And they say, well, if I come to work for you, uh, I would have to sell more properties. And my answer is, is always the same. If you don't want to sell more properties, I really don't want to hire you because yeah, I yeah. want people that want to sell as many properties as they can during their work time so that they can be as profitable as they can. Yeah. So I think that's sort of a disconnect. And I, I don't yeah. think it's generational. I, I hate to take away the claim that your generation is <laughs> has more slot than any other generation. But I, I think it's just a, a matter of fact. People want quick and easy solutions. Um, they figure the, the higher, I, I, I mean, we roll back people when they come to work with us very frequently um, in their commission splits, but then they end up taking home more money. So they're very happy at the end of the day. Right on. Great. So. That's cool. No, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think young people, especially people like Brandon, who works. <laughs> Good looking, talented. So infrequently. Sexy. Now, Brandon's one of the hardest working people I know. But <laughs> no, it, it's, it's, it's something we see on Bigger Pockets with a lot of investors like, you know, hey, how do I make money with doing the least amount of work possible? I know when I was an agent, it was the same thing. You know, how do I get away with doing the bare minimum four hour work week? doesn't really help <laughs> that um, mindset. But, uh, you know, hard work, the, the hardest working people I know are the most successful people I know. So, you know, I, I typically believe that there's... Uh, it's so uh, coincidental. Oh, yeah. It's just, oh, yeah. just by accident that the hardest yep. working people you know are the most successful. Yeah, weird. Exactly, weird. exactly. So let's, yeah. let's transition this a little bit. So you're in the business, you know, you've obviously, you understand the business from, from all angles. How did you get into real estate investing and why did you get into real estate investing? I, I got into real estate investing because I believe that you make a living by selling real estate and you create wealth by buying real estate. I love that. Okay. Uh, or you want another great, uh, another great saying? That's, that's it tweetable. From, that, it came from a broker that, that I worked for for years who said the biggest mistake that he ever made in real estate was in buying real estate was selling it. Ah. He was a big believer of buying and holding. And he, nice. had, he, he became a very wealthy guy buying real estate. And then he would sell it. And a few years later, it'd be worth even more. And it was like, oh, my God, yep. if I yep. had just kept that, because now I've spent the money I got from selling. It. Yeah. So um, so I like buying houses. I, I knew when I was younger that, you know, I had a, a, a son. I, I was hoping to educate him. So, you know, I began by buying a property that had a 15 year mortgage when he was, I guess, nine or 10. And knowing that in uh, seven years, I would pay off 30% of the debt and assuming a, a little bit of appreciation that I felt I could count on at that time, I figured that that house would be a year of college for him. Then I figured I'm, I'm being in real estate and being self-employed, I'm really never gonna get a pension from anyone. I really didn't believe when I was younger uh, that I would get social security because I figured it would collapse under its own weight. Sure. I'm still not sure that's going to happen. So yeah. I figured buying houses and having mortgages that, that and, and then having mortgages that would pay off over a period of time would give me income when I was older and I wanted to do stuff because to retire and have to stay home and count pennies <laughs> sort of sucks. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not a good retirement. I don't Another think. tweetable quote right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, well, well but but so here's here's my question, and and I, we definitely want to get into your real estate and the types of deals that you've done and things like that. But you know, my I was I was an agent, and the first thing that I asked when I became an agent to all the other agents is, why aren't you guys buying property yourself? It was the first thing, and everybody was like, oh, I don't know, and you know, I didn't know anything back then, and I was a terrible agent, probably uh, as bad as you were in the early days, and uh, uh, but. 
I just like I never got it, and to this day I still don't get it. You know, we we've got tons of great people in our community who are agents that are investing, but the the large majority of agents that I go to, that I meet at conferences and and just meet, you know, in in my day to day, they're like, I, I don't know, I don't get it. I don't, you know, it's 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 something they can't even see. They don't imagine well, either, themselves it, even being able to do it. I think either they're risk averse, you know, they they're just scared. Because that we see all look, we we really do see all the horror stories, you know. People sure. that buy things, yeah. they get over their heads. The place needs work. It's a terrible tenant. Look at you know. I, I just don't want that stress. I, look, I I have a partner of mine, who and a, 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 someone in my real estate company, who years ago, I'm going to say twenty some years ago, began buying real estate, and her husband was a teacher, and they had. Uh, I got a call from her once. I, I forget where I was. Uh, your tenant just stabbed my tenant because we own two houses on the same block. Whoops. <laughs> now, I don't know what happened between the two tenants, but they had some kind of fight. It was a low income area, sure. you know, and, and it was too much drama for her husband who said, look, you, you got to get out of this. I, I don't want to get those calls. I don't want to worry about the property. I don't yeah. want to have to re-rent it. I mean, there's a certain amount of, you know, investing in real estate for most people um, they, they don't look at it as work, but, but it is there. I mean, there's, uh, unlike buying a CD, there's actual work involved, Yeah, right. you know, place gets empty. You got to fix it up. You got to re-rent it. If, if you're the kind of, the reason I tell people never to, um, rent a place that they've lived in is I, I would, con- I believe they, they take it personally when a tenant doesn't keep the property well, and then you have additional emotional stress. For me, it was it was always a business. If I buy a piece yeah. of real estate and it becomes empty, if there's a fire, if there's a problem, if if there's a repair, I just have to do it. But I never, when when I started investing, I never anticipated taking cash flow. I, I was already making a living. I just wanted the yeah. properties to build equity because it was an easier way for me to build some kind of wealth. I'm I'm not a great saver, you know. If I if I make a bunch of money, I can put a chunk in the bank. But I'm not a good program, ten dollar a week kind of guy. It just takes yeah. too long for me to get anywhere. Gotcha. So gotcha. I, I think the risk adverse, um, the the fact that they don't want to take the emotional stress. Um, many in- agents I don't think have enough cash left over at the end of the day to begin investing. You know, a lot of um, there are a lot of people who live to the limit of their income. Yeah. yeah. And you know, and who live from larger paycheck to paycheck. Um, I was always a worrier, so I always sort of under, um, undershot, didn't undershoot my income. I, the things that were important, you know, my kid went to a private school. He went to a private university. He came out with no educational debt. That was what was important to me. Sure. But um, I had guys that I worked with who made less money than I did, who drove fancier cars or lived in a bigger house. And I mean, that's cool. Everybody chooses to spend their money the way they want. Um, and even for me, I mean, when I when I started investing, I really invested with, I didn't have a lot of cash. I just tried to be creative. Right on, so. right on. And, and I'd, I'd love to talk about that, but before I do, I've got a really serious question. Are you peeing sure. while we're on the podcast? No, I no, hear, I hear this. Um, I, <laughs> so I have, a, I have a, a waterfall in my oh, office. Oh, a water feature. And it is a very <laughs> <How lovely>. soothing, <laughs> calming sound, which is not at all like a running toilet <laughs> or, a, or a creek coming off the side, but is very calming when people come in for stressful conversations. Uh, you know, and I one. don't notice it after a while, but I, <laughs> I'm pleased that you guys did. And it was a gift when I rehabbed this building. Oh, nice. Nice. All right. So th- that's great. I mean, everything you said makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about your first deal. What, what was the first deal that you got into? In, and, investing, and, deal. Um, investing deal. Real estate investing deal, yeah. The first deal I had was a um, an assumption on a, uh, a VA property. Okay. It was, we actually created a, a little bit of a wraparound on it. You're familiar with the wraparound as a vehicle, I'm sure. Let, let's yeah, explain maybe, it for yeah. the listeners who may not know. So there was a there was a debt of I'm, I'm going to use small numbers, but there was a debt of say uh, twenty thousand. Um, I was buying the property for say twenty five thousand. 
Um, and the, we, I created a $25,000 instrument of debt, a portion of which went to pay off the $20,000 mortgage and a portion of which went to pay off the $5,000 in equity to the sellers. But, but the, the secret there was that I had two owners that um, didn't want to be owners anymore. So it was easier for me to structure a transaction because they weren't worried about how much they were taking out. They weren't worried about whether they got a lump of cash. They just didn't want to own that property anymore. Um, so there was that. Um, I was big on trying to find assumable loans back at that back at that time. So VAs and, and FHAs at the time were were assumable. And today, um, today they're and, generally not, right? I mean, I think VA might still have some kind of assumption thing. VA, VA is still the problem with the VA is if you assume the loan, the the portion of the veteran's eligibility that guarantees that loan stays there until the loan is paid off. So you really have to explain that to the vet because it would be, if they're planning on going out and using their VA for something else, they're sort of stuck. Okay. Yeah. And, and that would be unfair to, to do without letting them know. Yeah. And really quickly, can you just explain how an assumption works for those people, again, who may not know? Sure. Uh, an assumption is when really you're assuming the debt of the seller and you're making the payments on their behalf. Now, there, there are times when um, people do that without notifying the mortgage company because there's generally an alienation clause in the mortgage, which says if the original borrower is alienated or separated from the property, the, the loan becomes due. And we oftentimes now, so call that subject to. A lot of people on bigger pockets call it subject to. Well, that, right. That's, right. A, that's a subject to rather than yep. assumption. An assumption is actually a transfer of the debt to you, generally not releasing the first, uh, the first borrower. But, and, and yeah, I don't typically see assumptions anymore. I know those are the thing. Like if you read old real estate books, you know, from the eighties, sure, yeah, we rarely hear about. Yeah, it. you hear them all the time. But yeah, banks started getting wise and saying, "Wait a second, if all these people are just assuming this new loan, I don't know who the new borrower is. I don't know if they're going to pay me on time. I don't know anything about yeah. them." Hey, uh, Brandon, yeah. can you be polite to our guests? I mean, calling them old is not cool. <laughs> not cool. Sorry, I, I, Bill. Listen, I apologize I'm, for my co-host. I'm, I'm fine with it. I have I have no problem with that. You know what they say? The the alternative is much worse. So I'm, I'm, I'm all good. I, go. Look, I'm I'm leaving here when I'm done talking to you guys to go to to go to Las Vegas. That sounds uh, good. And then flying back tomorrow night. Nice. So age notwithstanding, it's not slowing me down at all. Well, don't worry. You get all the senior benefits when you fly, so you're good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I get I, well, I get I get upgraded. I fly a lot. Oh, there so, you go. Oh, man. And free, wa- free waffles so, at the casino or something. All right. Yes, ab- <laughs> absolutely. It's at all dinner good. at three. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, it's, so, you know, you guys are much safer doing this over <laughs> online than you would be if we were face to face. But I like. It. All right. So you you you're doing all these creative things. Did you just learn that on on your own, or was that something that you picked up from you know the the other real estate uh, brokers or agents that you well, worked Josh, with? Josh, clearly he read the book on investing in real estate with no and low money down by oh, Brandon boy. Turner. Clearly he read that, and he probably got it from <laughs> biggerpockets.com slash no money. Wow, right no, 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 that, <laughs> at that time we were actually reading parchments. Okay, so okay, it wasn't, that, it wasn't so much books; they were more of these scrolled kind of things. Right. No, I mean, basically, yeah. I was just I was looking for opportunities. You know, I've always been. Um, I, I'm a very big believer in um, your price, my terms, my price, your terms. So if I could get, if I didn't have cash, then I needed to be able to give price so that I could get terms that worked for me. Yeah. You know, as I became, um, as I became wealthier and I had the cash, then I could go in and you know make a lower, buy it for less. Because I'm giving the other person great terms. Yeah. Hey, you know, I'll, look, I'll buy you cash. I don't care if you clean it out. If you want to leave this stuff here for a month, if you want to settle it in 30 days, I can do that. If you want to settle it in 30 months, I can do that too. I'm not going anywhere. So you were willing to pay more for a property in order to get the terms that you wanted so that you can actually get sure. your hands on the property. Sure. Well, and because, and remember, my strategy at that point was to buy the property and have the rent pay off the debt. Look, I, I believe that everybody who in in the United States who has a periodic payment for housing is paying somebody's mortgage. Yep. They may be paying their own. They may be paying the landlords. Yep. So I wanted to get I wanted to borrow money and then have somebody else pay it back for me. Yep. I thought that was like the best thing ever. 
So that was how initially I began buying. Perfect. And I, you know, I created a small portfolio and, and then, you know, I mean, of course you want to buy the store that you're operating your business out of, you know, you want to own your primary home at some point. It's nice to own a vacation home. So, and then, then you can parlay those things over time if that's not your, your eating money. You know what I mean? And I always made a living as a real estate agent and then broker. So, I, I mean, I, we, you know, we always had a, a nice lifestyle, but in the background, the real estate's being paid off and we're building equity. That's cool. Right I mean, you know, something I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, whether or not somebody becomes an agent or not. I love the idea of separating the investment side from the business side, right? You need to make money to eat. You need to make money to oh, pay yeah. your bills. And a, a, an agent, being an agent is an incredible way to do that because you also get all the, you know, first dibs on deals as they come on the market. You get all the cool tools. You don't have to have your agent show it. But like, you I mean, you could also do, you know, if you love teaching high school math, go teach high school math if that's what you love right. to do. But, you know, think about the investing as well. Like, you don't want to do this forever. You don't want to be, you know, 95 and still teaching high school math probably. No, I, I agree. I, especially because they've changed it to this core math, which becomes <laughs> far more confusing. But no, no, I think, look, I think the, the, the investing is investing no matter what you do for a living. I, I, I knew a guy, I had a guy that worked for me once as an agent and he was a day trader in stocks. That's always very confusing for me. You know, some guy has an affair with his girlfriend with with his secretary in Albany and I lose money in Philadelphia. Uh, yep. <laughs> that, I, I don't like that. Houses make sense to me. People need yeah. to eat. They need a place to live. They need they need clothing. So those things are our core. So if you if you own a home and you maintain it and you buy it with the right the right principles, you know, the right price, you know, you're not buying it for stupid reasons because somebody else paid a lot of money for it. I, like I'm OK not buying a property if it's more money then I think it's worth at this point. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, I'm just trying to get in the game. Once you're in the game, it becomes easier. And then as you accumulate some assets, um, buying money without taking, uh, I'm sorry, buying property without taking money out of your pocket becomes much easier Yeah. because banks love lending money to people that don't need it. Yep. Yes. So how, how many deals have you done so far as, a, as an investor, approximately? As the, as the eyes go back in his head. Well, no, I mean, so um, approximately. Yeah. Uh, buying and flipping, buying and holding, ground, developing, building, all of it. Sure. Yeah. Between 800 and 1,000 transactions. Woo. Not awesome. that impressive. Hey, Brandon, why do we even bring <laughs> yeah, this really, on the show? And they're small because we have low average sale prices. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so eight, that's, a, that's, that's a lot. That's pretty impressive. I mean, this is, you know, you, you've been doing this for like, you know, 80 years, so I get it. Um, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm actually only 35, but I got it. <laughs> Life has know? been rough on Bill, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 800 transactions. I mean, that's not inconsequential by any means. So I, I guess what I, uh, you know, I think we could talk for hours and hours, and unfortunately, I know you you don't have a ton of time today. Um, maybe we can get you on and dig in a little bit deeper. I, I what's what's been your favorite type of deal? My favorite type of deal, the one where I pay a little for something and sell it for a lot. <laughs> I like them a lot. That no, that's fun. Way to be specific. Right. Um, well, no, no. I, I love, so so a lot of a lot of my portfolio, the, the stuff that I own, where I started, was buying single family homes and renting them. I find single family, you know, a three bedroom home. It's easy to rent. Um, in our marketplace, the um, generally you you can uh, uh, have a positive cash flow um, with a reasonable deal. Um, I like value added stuff, um, but those are good because you can accumulate them. But but I've done like a lot of things. You know, I've walked around and had. Uh, you know, been the managing partner to, to get somebody to go out and build it. Yeah. Um, my, one of my favorite things was we bought we bought a um, a motel at the Jersey Shore, and it was a really nice size one. And within thirty days, we traded the big motel that we had bought for two smaller motels and a small bucket of cash. Actually, it was a moderate size bucket of cash. Nice. Um, so I like that one a whole lot because we were going to knock down the one motel and uh, build on it. And we ended up with two building sites 
and with a bunch of additional cash and we got all our money out and it was 30 days. Wow. So mm. that was a, that was a really, but that's serendipitous. That's not, yeah. I'm, I'm a big believer of grinding out singles, yeah. you know, and hoping for the occasional double, not, I'm not always shooting for the home run. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. And, talk, and that's worked well for me. Talk, talk about the motels for, for a second, because I don't, I don't think that we've actually spoken to anyone on the show before about motels. So I don't know if you just had that one. No, because you, uh, you, you ended up trading for those two smaller motels. Right. Um, did you guys hold on for a while? And, and what, was, what was running a motel? Well, no, the, 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 um, the strategy at the time was to buy motels, knock them down, and build townhouses or oh. condominiums because it was 2003, 4, and 5. So they were, they were really strong. And of course, um, the problem is when, you know, the Jersey Shore is a secondary market. It's a resort market. Yep. So it's a resort market specifically for uh, the, the South Jersey Shore, specifically for Philadelphia, just as the North Jersey Shore, Asbury Park and North would be um, a, a, a resort area for New York. New York, yeah. Um, so the problem is when the market goes south, vacation homes are the first thing people don't care about anymore. When the market's really hot, everybody wants a vacation home, yep. you know, but it's not something you need. So it, the conservative part of me as an investor loves owning stuff that people need. Yeah. Like I, 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 the three bedroom, bath and a half, three bedroom, two bath, row or semi-detached home. A row home is a townhouse, but it's cheaper. Yeah. But we had them, we had them 120 years ago. They don't so, really have them out west except in San Francisco, right? Right, right. So, but, but it, we, because we had textile workers and that was uh, inexpensive housing that was built for them. We have a really big base of them, and they're really, they're really efficient. They're easy to rent. There's only two exposed walls. They're not expensive to heat, um, and they generally will provide a rental that is higher than um, the 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 cost of financing. Yeah. Um, so I, I like them. I like them a lot. That's you know even within investing, I think you want to have your core that's that's generating your base. And then you can try for the things where you might make a couple of bucks, you know, that, that become income. Um, I, I like a value add. Uh, uh, a friend of mine just brought a two family uh, that I helped her with. Um, it was a, an estate. Um, the two units will rent for about nine fifty a thousand a piece. Um, they the 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 acquisition and renovation cost they'll be in under two hundred. So, so it's and, about and a one percent deal. Place. Yeah, yeah, so it's right. So that's a nice deal all day long, and and if she wanted to, she could sell it and take a profit. But because she rehabbed it so well, um, it's much smarter for her to hold it longer. Yep, yep. So you you talk about value add. You know, can you can you dive in just for a second on that? What, you know, sure. what, what type of value adds do you find? At wow, what a stupid question to add the most value. But you know, uh, so I love <laughs> smelly houses. Yeah, you know, smelly houses to me mean money. Yep. Because they'll turn off the yep. average consumer. Yep, I love so, it. So, um, you know, to me, I guess the the four big things that will give you value add are um, paint, flooring, kitchen, and bath. Yep. And if you if you can do that, so that it's visually impactful. And financially responsible, I think it's a you're going to make a profit every time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, let's let's dig in a little bit more on um, timing and 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 you know since you've you've been around for a little bit, um, the real estate crash and uh, you know uh, what, what was it two thousand eight? How did how did that, that affect? That was one of them. Uh, well, uh, you know the the most recent one. Yeah. Most of our most of our listeners aren't quite, you know, <laughs> um, using canes and wheelchairs yeah. to get around right. as a result they're 12 of twelve and under. I, I, I yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, the uh, the the okay. So let's talk about this. You can talk about the previous one too. I don't know if we will get well, no, it. No, no. But what what I'm going to say to you is that that um, I've never met anybody who owned a property for ten years who didn't make money on it. Yeah. The second thing I'm going to tell you is that you make the profit on a property when you buy it, not when you sell it. Yeah, that's deep and that's tweetable. Yeah, and true. Both, you know, um, but <laughs> but it's, I, I think that's really true. I mean, we didn't in through through the recession. We had 
more vacancies than we might have had. We had sure. some additional expenses. We had um, some investment pieces that were ground or for building that just weren't going anywhere that needed to be carried by the portfolio. But the, the bread and butter stuff, that three bedroom row home, yep. people got to live there all day long. They got to live there in a recession. They got to live there when times are good. And if you've bought them well and you need to um, take cash out, you can always resell them. But even in a recession, you don't recognize a loss until you sell something. Yep. So I have a place in L.A. Um, when, I, when I bought it, um, the market was very strong. And I actually spoke to a friend of mine who owned a large company out in California. And I said, I'm thinking about buying something in L.A. because my son lives out there. What do you think? He said, look, if you don't mind the ride down, it won't be a problem. Yeah. So let's say that I, I bought the property at 600000 that when the market tanked, it went down to four fifty, and my neighbor literally across the hall from me sold recently for eight ten. So did I have a loss? No. Ever. Never. You know? yeah. And the truth is, even now, it's for me to use. I don't want to sell it. Yeah. So I'm not even going to recognize a profit. But when I bought it, I bought something that was in a solid location, wasn't far from LAX. It was a newer development. There was a section of the development that was going to be built that was um, tied up with environmental issues um, that, that since has become a new campus for Google, YouTube, and, and it's, they're calling it Silicon Beach. Oh, so wow. all of a sudden, the condo that I bought, and I guess it's nine years now, the condo that I bought nine years ago, which... Um, I guess seven years ago would have been a loss had I sold it. Now I'm brilliant. Just yeah. <laughs> yep. So the, the way to become smart in, in real estate investing is to buy something and hold. Yep. Because the That's longer awesome. you have it, the smarter you are. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, well, so who, who runs your business? I mean, you've done 800 transactions. You're runs running. Business? Well, you're running this real estate uh, brokerage. Is there someone over my shoulder that I can't see? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, is it, older, is it I just you? Uh, yeah, look at this <laughs> guy. Know. All sorts of jokes. All sorts of jokes. <laughs> right. I, is it just you? Do you have partners? What, how, how's your business structured? Well, so my. So now we're talking about my which business? Real, are we this is your I'm investing. Bu- your investing business. Okay. So in my in my investing, I have a um, I have a single real estate partner whom I have been buying and selling with for, I guess, 15, 16, 17 years. Um, And and we are partners in everything. And we, and and over the years, we've had another, uh, a number of other people who have partnered with us on individual projects or that sort of thing. Um, I own a property management company, so that manages um, our units as well as managing units for third parties. Got it. Um, but that's who that's who runs the business. The inmates are running the asylum. There, there you go. go. <laughs> nice, cool. nice. And and are you re- really quickly? I know Brandon. I know we need to move on. Uh, but are you active? Are you the active manager of the management company as well? I mean, you you've got a lot of entities going on. So are you running all those businesses, or do you have other people kind of running them for you? So when you're the boss, yes, or the owner. You're always the guy that solves the problems. I don't know if that answered your question. But if there's a problem in my real estate business. You solve it. And it escalates up to me. I'm the guy that's got to solve it. Got it. You're not taking phone calls from tenants. You're not taking toilet phone calls of my toilet's not running. No. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, no, those, <laughs> those phone calls, I don't care. But, but, if there's, but I do take the phone call when there's a fire in your building. Yeah. You know, when, when one of the buildings is caught on fire, then I'm going to be involved because we're going to have to decide how we're handling the claim. We're going to have to decide what we're doing with lost rent insurance. We have to decide what we're doing with the tenant. Um, but, but I have a, a I have a, um, we manage about 550 units and I have one, two, um, three uh, clerical people that handle the intake of repairs and stuff. We use a cloud-based piece of software. Um, and then I have a full-time leasing agent who's one of my uh, real estate people whose primary job is to keep our stuff occupied. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Let me let me ask fi- my final question before we move to the, the next part uh, of the show here. And that is, 
you're talking, we've got you know, probably 80, 100 plus thousand people listening to this thing. What would you tell the new investor who comes and hears you and says, well, you know, that's great. This guy's done 800 deals. He's been there forever. You know, how do I get going? How do I start to do this on the side while doing something else? What approach should I take? What would you tell that guy? Um, you take the, the elephant approach. Thank you. That was great. All right, moving no on. No problem. Glad I could, <laughs> glad I could clear it up. See you guys later. I got to <laughs> so, no, clarify. It's the, it, it's the old joke about how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Yeah. So if you want to get started buying an investment, the first thing you have to do is understand what the core, what the what your goals are in buying the investment. You know, is it income? Is it equity building? You know, I mean, what the, there are all kinds of different, there are all kinds of different deals, and you guys know that. And we could talk about that for hours. Yep. But then you have to go and you you have to do the hard work. You have to sift through all of the chaff to find that good deal. And you have to recognize the good deal. And then you have to do your gazintas, which Josh Josh now knows what that is because we did a, a tech edge together in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. So the gazintas are like two gazinta four, four gazinta eight. You do your gazintas, you figure out the numbers. And if the numbers work, you make an offer. Yep. And if they say no, you move on and you sift through more chaff and you look for another deal. You know, it, it's really, the hard part is not doing deals. The hard part is finding deals. Yep. I, I get driven crazy by these guys that go out and do seminars and get the people who are paying them for their books or, or audio downloads or however they're selling them these days. Um, and then, then let them be bird dogs. Mm -hmm. If you go out and find a transaction and send the transaction back to me within 72 hours, We'll run the numbers and we'll let you know and we'll put the money up and ba 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 and you'll get ten percent. I would love to have people going out finding me deals and I'll give them ten percent. You know, and then these these poor guys go out and they they call realtors with these scripts yep. that are are so annoying that when I hear them, the first <laughs> question is like, "Did you go to a seminar recently?" Yep. You know, or or do you just need to change your deodorant because there's something here <laughs> that doesn't smell right. And 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 that's a Finding the deal. It's just going out and looking for the deal, finding the deal, knowing what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, and being clear about it. Because I run into a lot of early investors that they, they know that buying real estate is sort of a good idea and that people that have money have real estate and people that have real estate have money, but they're not quite sure how it all works. Yep. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Makes cool. sense. Makes sense. All right, my last question before we go to the fire round is uh, how many hours a week do you typically work? Like with all real estate combined, how many hours do you think you work? Oh, seven, eight hundred hours a week. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, there's a, a four, concept isn't it? called leisure that, sure. that has come into the world. So I travel a lot, but I, you know, I, I carry multiple screens with me. I do email. My phone works everywhere in the world. Or everywhere that I've been in the world, and I've been a bunch of places. So everywhere that I've taken it, it's worked so far. So I work remotely. Um, I, I don't know. I never, I never counted it. I just want to do what has to be done. I like making a lot of money because then I can have a nice house. I can drive a nice car. I can travel to exotic places, and I can talk to you guys. Yeah, you know. That is a and requirement to talk to us. We have like an income, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have an income well, I, level. I, listen, I, I actually <laughs> said to someone last week, and I believe this, I'm really not all about money. If I had a Willy Wonka ticket that allowed me to do anything I wanted, anytime I wanted without worrying about it, I'd be fine not to have money. Yeah. yeah. But the truth is the things that I like to do cost money. Yep. So I don't count the hours. I just do what I got to do to get it done. There you go. There you go. That's cool. I love it. All right. Well, hey, let's shift gears and head over to the fire round. It's time for the fire round. All right. Let's get to the fire round. These short, these are short, quick fire them at you, fire them back at me sort of answers. You ready for this? Number one. Sure. They're actually not very short questions today, but number one, is it a bad idea to buy a multifamily property close to a university? Am I just going to get party animals? Depends. 
<laughs> you can expand a little more. <laughs> you said you had a short answer. Well I mean, done. That, that's, well, he follows that's instructions. Silly, that's a silly question. If you buy a multifamily <laughs> for a university and you run it properly, no, you shouldn't get or you shouldn't get uh, party animals because you should screen your tenants better. I like it. There you go. Perfect answer. All awesome. Right, number awesome. two. All right, number two. Uh, this, uh, yeah, these That's are some a, serious questions. But I love questions. the I love this question. I'm, I go, it, I'm, I'm going curious. to get my real estate license. Wondering, the, I'm wondering what the least expensive way to hang my license is. I believe it's a law that you have to hang it somewhere. But the purpose of getting my license is for access uh, to the MLS for finding properties, comps, and saving money on realtor fees when flipping. So it's an investor. They want to uh, go get their license, right. and they want to know. So the, the cheapest least way to hang your license is with duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to be an investor, be an investor. If you want to be a real estate agent, be a real estate agent. Pick one. Ooh, that's good advice. Ooh. That's interesting. A lot of people uh, say really, you should... I think, I mean, if you can be a real estate agent and be good at it mm-hmm. and then go out and invest, not a problem. If you're an investor who comes in that thinks that being a real estate agent is some sort of magic switch to make you a better investor, it's not. And actually, I would advise you not to get your license. Just be an investor because real estate licensees have greater liability, higher risk, and have to make far more disclosures than the regular investor. Great information. Yeah. Cool. All right. Awesome. Number three. My name is Darren. I'm age 21 from Ohio. Uh, I'm highly interested in getting my first property, which is a 10 unit, and I'm nervous as hell. I don't really care, though, because I'm trying to do big things in life. But I have no money, and I'm, compl- I'm yeah, I have no money, and I need something to calm my nerves. What advice would you give me? Okay, so to begin with, Darren, who's 21 in Ohio, I have no desire to date you, <laughs> so I don't know why you started with all of that stuff. You you want to buy it? it there, is there like a real 10 unit, or he has a? It mythical sounds 10 like unit? it sounds like he's got one there somewhere. It sounds like it's in Detroit because it's, uh, it's in Ohio, uh, from right? What we have. Is that well, Ohio? Detroit, oh, it's Ohio. Ohio. Uh, it's probably it's Cleveland. Cleveland. Oh, no, it says Ohio. Whoops. But 130000 for a 10 unit is. So it says is, here, he wrote 130 for a 10 so unit. So, in, in, in my world, and there are, parts of, there are parts of Ohio that are very, uh, very well, not depressed, but they they're struggle. really cheap. Yeah. yeah. So, if it's a low income 10 unit, um, I, I would suggest at 21 that you be a little careful and mindful about. Again, the screening of tenants and the cost of repairs and whether you'll have the money to keep the property in a good enough condition to attract a higher quality tenant there. Because handling 10 units, at, in, in my world, if it was 10 units at 130, there'd be something wrong. Oh, yeah. and, and we're in a cheap market. We're in an inexpensive market in Philly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I need to know more about that. But I would just... I would be careful and make sure of my resources before I went into the job. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes people do is they, you know, they think they can get in. They don't consider all the capex, all all the things that are going to hit them down the line, and they're yeah. like, "Oh, wait, I'm out of business six months later." Right. Um, right. All right. Last question. I'm new to the real estate community and don't have much experience or friendships in the business. I work hard mostly six days a week and 12 to 14 hour days, and I would rather work that hard for myself. Is there any advice or tip uh, you all with much more experience and expertise than I would offer to me? Uh, Starting with a little bit of money seems impossible, though I do have a fairly decent credit score. Any advice you have would be helpful. Well, I'm not sure if this guy's trying to find friends or investments. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a little confused there. Um, I would suggest that he might want to network a little bit to get a clue. But was the question, how could he, inv- like, I, I think it's just question really advice. He's just saying uh, yeah, just general advice. Wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that he should, um, if he's working 16 hours a day, he needs to work a little bit more efficiently yeah. or he's got to go out and meet some people that are around during the other the remaining eight hours because you should have a life. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, I think you, you want to make a living, but you should also have a life. Get a girlfriend, a boyfriend, <laughs> you know, a significant other of some sort. Get a dog. Well, ba- maybe not. 16 hours <laughs> is time for the dog to stay yeah, home. That's not good. Yeah, poor dog. Good. You know. All right. All right. All right. Fair enough. Deal. Well, moving on good to stuff. the very last segment of the show, which we lovingly call our famous boss. All right, these questions are what? <laughs> four. I'm sorry, the false settings lost me there. <laughs> that's, that's, well, we're, 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 ta- we're talented. We're, we're talented. We're really good singers. All right, yeah. the famous four 
These questions yes. are asked every week of every guest. And so uh, it's kind of fun to see what different people say. Sometimes they say the same, sometimes others. So we're going to throw them at you. Number one. I'd like to give you the famous four answers, which are yes, no, sometimes, <laughs> maybe. All right. We'll see how that lines up. Number one, your favorite real estate book. Yes. I don't know that book. <laughs> favorite yeah. real estate book. book. Yeah. Real estate book. My favorite real estate book was actually, is actually out of print. Okay. It was for, it was for real estate agents and it was called list more, sell more by a guy named Jerry Bresser. And it made me a listing person when I was uh, just after I had just worked with buyers, okay. taught me all the scripts, everything I needed. Cool. Nice. cool. Never heard that one. All right. Favorite business book. My favorite business book. Um, I like the E-Myth. Mm -hmm. I like know, that too. Which, which has been rewritten a couple of times. It was a mid-70s thing. But it does separate the difference between um, being an entrepreneur and being good at your job and why sometimes you shouldn't go out and open a business. Yep. There yeah. you go. Love that book. All right. You, you talk about having fun, spending time on, on, on good things and joy. So what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Yeah. Um, I know I'm, I'm not hitting on you. <laughs> I, I, so I just came back from two weeks in Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and uh, Slovakia. I am uh, headed next week to Marin County to do uh, a Tech Edge um, event on Tuesday. And I will fly from there to San Diego Comic Con, where nice. um, I will spend four days nerding out. Are you going to dress up? Um, excuse me? Are you going to dress, dress up? dress up? Are you going no, to Spider-Man? I oh. take pictures of people that dress up. Okay. But I hang out with people that write comics and movies and TV shows, and we, we watch the people that dress up to imitate the things that they create, which is really a lot of fun. Yeah, sure, yeah. Sounds cool. So you're a comic nerd, and you travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a comic nerd. I travel. I'm a foodie. Um, I love movies. Uh, I'm best, a big fan Best of movie of all time. What was the best what? movie of all time? Best movie best of all time. Best movie of all time? Yeah. Yeah. Nah, I can't do it. Uh. Can't. There, there is no one best movie. Favorite you'd comic. In, you'd have to break it into genres. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I'm a big fan of um, Superman and the Lone Ranger. Um, not, not just as comics, but. That was I'm like a black and white thing, wasn't it? Excuse me? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, but, I'll, I'll pass my question. <laughs> okay. No, it was, I, I like them because they were old school values. Yeah. They were good guys helping. They were, they were strong helping the weak. They were doing the right thing and they were um, doing things to make the community better. So I like that. I'm, I'm very distressed about the country right now just because everybody's so busy being part of an individual tribe. They're forgetting that we have this larger tribe that accepted all of our disparate and running ancestors at one time and allowed us to be sitting here and doing this. Yeah. So, but so I like Superman and the Lone Ranger old school, but a lot of fun. So like Superman it. versus Batman. Not so great. Yeah. All right. Last Brandon? question of the day. Number four, what do you believe sets apart successful investors or agents? We'll say from those who give up, fail, or just never seem to get traction. They never get started. Work ethic and persistence. Okay. It's that simple. Show up, do it. The, the, the reason I am where I am today and guys that started with me are not is because I just kept doing it every day, whether it was hard, whether it was easy. If things were going great or things were going bad, it's, it's what I needed to do because I wanted to build something over a period of time. And it, it's worked very well for me. I have a a life that I'm sometimes jealous of. It's so good. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, All right, it. Bill, before we, before we let you go, where can people find out more about you? Where can they link up with you? Um, they could go to BillLublin.com. They can find me on Twitter at Bill Lublin. They can go to C21AG.com or .net, which is my real estate company. I, I'm actually fairly ubiquitous electronically. So yeah. you, could, you, could, you could Google me. Like my friend Todd Carpenter says, I'm kind of a big deal. There you go. <laughs> Good guy, that Todd Carpenter. He's awesome. It. I love it. I love it. All right, Bill. Well, thank you so much. I, I I wish we had more time to dig in deeper on a lot of the things that we wanted to dig in on. Dig in on, but maybe we'll have you back down down the line. Thanks again, and we'll see you around. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure, guys. All right, thank you.
All right, everybody, that was Bill Lublin. Big thanks to Bill. Obviously, he can crack jokes with the best of them and, <laughs> and knock out real estate deals with the best of them, too. That he can. Yeah, he's uh, serious. That was, that was fun asking him, how many have you done? And he really had to sit there and go, wait, like, yeah. let's, let's add them all up kind of. And yeah, at least 800, maybe 1,000, maybe more. I knew Crazy. he did a lot of deals. I didn't realize it was, it was that high. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's very impressive. Yeah, that's very, very impressive. impressive. Now, what do you think I, about his? What do you think about his advice about not getting your license if you're an investor? Oh man, it was a little bit spot. Yeah, it was I, a little bit controversial. Yeah, a little controversial. I, you know, I, I get it, um, and and I, I think, I think his points were were certainly valid. I mean, there there absolutely are additional responsibilities that come with a real estate li- license. Um, there's additional liability. There's all sorts of other stuff that can affect you. And and I'm glad he mentioned it because I, I don't think we've ever actually really talked about that. So, you know, heed, heed that advice and, and make a yeah. decision. You know, if you're willing to to put up with some of those uh, things that, that come with it uh, in, in order to uh, get the value that comes with a license, you know, quicker, easier access to the MLS, uh, the ability to go look at deals on your own, go for it. Obviously, you make your own decision. But uh, that's that's what I would say. Yeah. And, you know, I don't have my license. I know you used to have yours. I've never had mine. And because yeah. uh, I want to, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, but I want to be the best investor I can be. I don't want to try to become an agent and an investor, though it would be really nice to have those tools. And yeah. uh, I likely will get my license at some point. But uh, yeah, anyway, cool show. So, or I mean, or, or as an alternative, at some point, you'll have a licensed agent as part of your team. And- yes. And that might work just as well. I mean, bring on maybe, I mean, I have, I have a full-time assistant who works for our real estate company. Why not make her get her license or yep. encourage her to get hers? And exactly. then I can get the same benefit of not having to take that class. So, there you go. See, how about yeah, them apples? Interesting. All right. Well, anyway, yeah. let's get out of here. I, I, I would love to go to Comic-Con and, and watch Bill, <laughs> like, you know, throw on his Spider-Man or Lone I was Ranger hoping, outfit. yeah, I was hoping he was going to say he dressed up. <laughs> Too bad. That'd be awesome. Yeah. All right. That'd be cool. Well, let's get out of here, guys. Thank you so much for listening to the show. This is show 184 on the Bigger Pockets podcast. Please check out the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 184. Also, we do ask that you please jump on iTunes, on Google Play, on Stitcher, on SoundCloud. Subscribe to the show. Make sure to follow us, subscribe, leave us ratings and reviews, leave us feedback. We, we love that feedback, even uh, the occasional negative feedback, which we happen to uh, share at the podcast conference. That was it was quite entertaining, wasn't it? It was. It was entertaining. We had three one star reviews, and uh, they don't like us because we're what was the word? We're frat boys. One was or something. frat boys. One was childish, and yeah. the last one was because I share my shared yeah. a single tweet with a political view, and um, he like he that. was not happy. So fascinating stuff. Fascinating, fascinating. All right, guys, leave us those ratings and reviews. Get out of here. We'll see you next time. And oh, definitely make sure to check out Bigger Pockets, www.biggerpockets.com. Jump on the community at biggerpockets.com slash forums. And uh, till next week, I'm Josh Dorkin, signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.